Today is Monday, October 15, 2007. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing Robert Whitson for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center at Studio X Campbell Hall on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. David Noreen is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Why don't you tell us about your background as you were getting ready to go in the service? Well, I graduated from high school in 1938. I even had a $20 gift certificate from Carthage College, but I didn't see how $360 a year was going to pay for the rest of it. And that's what I made as a farmhand. And after about three years, things didn't look any different. And it happened to be the last day of the thrashing run near an iota, Illinois, and three of us farmhands had been told that we could stay and work for $25 a month instead of 30. And we were joking what our future would be working for $25 a month the rest of our life. And Navy recruiter was going to be in Carthage. And so we all down and I was the only one they took. <laughs> and and uh, you know, the interesting thing that day, the postmaster said to uh, the chief petty officer that was a recruiter, he said, Chief, I imagine these old farm boys have a lot of problems in the Navy. And the chief said, well, sir, I'll tell you, you have to get up early in the Navy, and these old farm boys know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why were your two friends not eligible? Well, one of them was my brother, and he had a little medical problem. and. Uh, the other one, he didn't really care to go anyway. The, and the interesting thing, my brother and I were best buddies. We grew up in Depression time, and we knew, took care of each other and so forth. It was a little problem. The oldest boy makes a rut that the second one has to run in. But Lyle, the next, he, we talked before I went, and I said, you know, I think you ought to get away from home too. And the CCC camp, and he joined the CCC camp, and it was the best thing that ever happened. The next June, he went to Peoria, and they didn't see that medical defect, <laughs> and he, he stayed in 21 years. He was a machinist, and the interesting thing was, the day that I made first class, I shook hands with my brother, a chief machinist mate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How long after you enlisted before you went into the service officially? Uh, enlisted, uh, the last week of July and on the, I think the 10th of September, I took the oath. We went to Rock Island. They did the preliminaries there. Took my first train ride from Rock Island to Chicago. It happened to be Pullman. And then in Chicago, they did the rest of the swearing, got our uniforms. At that time, the Navy was doing a really a lot of growth. Um, all the barracks were used up, and we were put in what was called the old airplane hangars, 1510A and 1510B at Great Lakes. And uh, the first week or two, we marched out in a place north of the barracks, and the next week they started building barracks, and the last week that we were there, there were people in those barracks. Now, wow. we were supposed to be there 20 weeks. In 10 weeks, we were heading to San Diego. And the thing I noted was, in some paperwork I've seen in recent years, the Milwaukee, USS Milwaukee, I went on it, and it, it, it was one of 10 cruisers that were commissioned in 1923. They had catapults, and they called them scout cruisers. Uh, there was 85 apprentice seamen, and that meant there were 85 men on that ship that hadn't been in the Navy four months yet. A little more research, there were seamen second. You, after four months, you became a seaman second. There was over 200 seamen seconds on there. Now, that meant that in the previous year, they were on there. So almost 300 new men. In peacetime, they didn't need that, but they were getting ready. And those cruisers were really training ships. We would go to um, general quarters for practice. They, 
they had a method for their battle problems, they would hand someone an envelope and say, a bomb just hit your station. And of course, if you were doing right, you were always checking it. After main battery control, main battery control testing, and if they didn't get an answer, why well, they had emergency. Right. So they did. They did a lot of that, and we did, just didn't do it. We'd do it at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'd do it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and 10 o'clock at night. Sometimes people just got awful full, fed up with tests, but it paid off in the end. So perhaps the second 10 weeks at Great Lakes would not have been as valuable as the 10 weeks on the Milwaukee training in the on cruises. I wholeheartedly agree with that, and uh, that was that <laughs> Great Lakes experience was interesting in another way. The old chief petty officers that had retired after 20 years were called back to push boots. Now, C.M. Smith was our commander, and he was really good. He he never really got mean with us, but he would say, oh, you can do better than that. Now, I seen a chief torpedo man, and he was always gonna knock the head off of somebody. And the story was years later, they had to go to sea after the war started. And uh, that chief torpedo man had a problem. He run into some people he was gonna knock the head off of. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some of those chiefs, when they got called to sea, couldn't take it. And I know R.C.M. Smith, he jumped overboard and wiped himself out. He didn't. Literally? Yep, he oh did. Oh, my gosh. Yep, he couldn't take it. How sad. And when I got on to Milwaukee, of course, the recruits, we were in what they called the X Division until they decided what to do with us. But the first day we were there, there was a fellow by the name of Jim Brennan. He was a torpedo in third class, and he come up to, the, and he was a really nice guy. And he said, "Now they need some men in the torpedo gang, and that is a good place to be." And Vic Werner from Mendota and myself, we decided to do that. And I was a striker. Whenever you were the head man, and he had an assistant. Your assistant was called a striker, and I was a striker. And the torpedo man took care of the catapults because they were fired by high pressure. And a torpedo man has a lot to do with high pressure air. And Brennan was a good man. I learned a lot from him. And he had a lot to do with me being able to get to go to elementary torpedo school the next year. And when I come back, he was gone from the ship. I never saw him again for years. So you were on the Milwaukee for how long? A uh, little over two years. I went on it in November of 40, and December the 5th of 42, I got transferred to USS Potoka for further transfer to the USS Herndon, the DD-638. A little interesting point there, the week that I was on the Potoka, I had a shipmate that was very famous Mr. and Mrs. North America and all the ships at sea, let's go to press. Walter Winchell. <laughs> he was a lieutenant commander walking the decks of the USS Potoka. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that was my first plane ride from Recife, Brazil to Natal. The next, that night, there was a fellow coming. He was a captain of a Eastern Airline plane, ferry command in the reverse and give us instructions to be ready at such and such a time. From Natal, we landed at Belém the next evening about four o'clock. The next morning we took off, we eat lunch at Georgetown, Ghana. That evening, we landed in Puerto Rico. And the next morning, I got another plane, a Navy plane, and went to Miami. And I figured I would be, my experience with receiving stations was terrific. I mean, it wasn't doing good they'd lose my orders and I'd be there 30 days. <laughs> so I figured I was gonna be there 30 days. About an hour later, they said, get your stuff together, you're going to Norfolk. So, <laughs> and got to Norfolk, this was in December. I had my white uniforms on and my pea coat was in the bottom of my sea bag 
and the temperature was 15 degrees. <laughs> so you had been in summer in yes. Brazil, and then two yep. days later south you were in Norfolk? South of the equator. Goodness. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the duty in the South Atlantic, and of course we were watching for blockade runners, and we went, we would spend some time in Rio de Janeiro and then go across in the, and we also spent time in Montevideo, Uruguay. At the, after the war started, there were undercover spies, German spies in both places. Um, at one time, we challenged a Norwegian ship and they couldn't answer the challenge. They finally run up the swastika before they scuttled the ship. I read the story. So they had scuttled the ship and you saved some of the crewmen? Yeah. They saved all of them. Just one person stayed on board. The skipper stayed on and went down with it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And uh, so you, I, a, you also tell about a mystery cruise. Oh, Do you have any insights as to that? Yes. What happened? Um, we, uh, it was in 1941, April 41, and we were in Newport, Rhode Island, and we went down to Norfolk and we picked up a doctor. Now, we didn't know what this was all about, and nobody knew what it was about until it came out in a magazine called Seascapes. There's not even any record in the Navy records. They've kept it. it was, and when we left Norfolk and headed east, after the second day, we were told to get the torpedoes battle ready. Now, this was before the United States was yes, in the war. Yes, this was April of 41. Okay. And the article, the Seascapes article tells them that even <clears throat> there was hardly anybody on the ship knew that this was a secret. I mean, the doctor that was on there, he knew. And the story was there were two pocket battleships at the Azores. German? German pocket battleships. And... Supposedly, we were going over there to challenge them. Well, when we got there, they had left. So we just went around to these oars and come back. And this doctor left the ship. And later on, he died in a prison camp in Japan. Incidentally, while we were getting those torpedoes ready, one of them got loose. And I grabbed a hold of it to slow it down and slid into the tube. The propellers were real close and then I got my arm out someone said what what happened to your arm and there was a gash and this muscle split open it took 12 stitches to <laughs> close that up <laughs> then but so uh, the, the doctor you mentioned the went on other spy missions and eventually was caught yeah oh, mm -hmm. he went to the uh, went to the Philippines and yeah oh my gosh yeah He's the one that sewed up the arm, too. <laughs> oh. Now, the Milwaukee had a doctor and a dentist, so we always had pretty good treatment on there. So you were saying that you took your first airplane flight from Brazil all the way to the States. Yes. And now you're about to shift to your destroyer. Why don't you start there? Well, okay. The, um, the next morning I got up and got ready and went, when I went aboard, why I give the Salute to, salute to the flag and Whitson torpedo in third class reporting award for duty and the PO said get true the chief torpedo man so he came down and he was taking me up to torpedo shack and he said how long have you been in the navy I said well two years last September my <laughs> gosh I finally got a torpedo in third class that's been in the navy <laughs> he he I next shook hands with two torpedo in third class that joined the Navy May of 1941, May of 1942. Right. And when they got out of boot camp, they went to torpedo school and they were third class when they got out. It took, took me two years to get there. <laughs> and uh, so then we, uh, Shook down. We went to Casablanca, and that now was this, the, the destroyer Hernan was just being commissioned. Is that correct? Yeah. When I went aboard, the chief torpedo and said, "How long has it been since you've been home?" And I said, "To about a year and a half." He said, "Get the torpedo officer," and 
in about 20 minutes, I was headed for Fort Madison, Iowa to get to Nyota, Illinois. And they commissioned the ship while I was on leave. So when, when one of the things I noted, and I always want to tell people, when I got home, I learned that everybody was fighting that war. It wasn't just the sailors and soldiers and Marines. It was everybody. They were saving scrap, rolls of tin foil. They were rationing gas, butter of all things, which I'd been used to having all I wanted. And, and they were doing it enthusiastically. Plus they were paying a little more tax. So that they, also what happened Immediately after Pearl Harbor, the um, torpedoes we'd told would cost $10,000. That's the reason I saved that one. So, <laughs> But right after the war, I think it was International Harvester Company, an engineer was sent to Newport, Rhode Island to look at the torpedo situation. Wasn't long, the torpedoes only cost $5,000 because when they entered machined a little part about that big, they did 20 of them. And so they started saving money, you know. So we, when I got back off leave, another thing that struck me and I said, boy, I'm on a good ship, is about one o'clock in the morning when I got back on board. And there on the 20, uh, 40 millimeter guns was the anti-aircraft officer and one of the gunners mate second class working on those guns trying to get them situated and that anti-aircraft officer was a really a good one he knew how to make things work so and it paid off in the future we went our fake down cruise was Casablanca and that was after they had landed there and were in Algiers I remember our first my first job when we were there I went ashore as a shore, uh, SP and the torpedo officer that would be shore patrol yeah shore yeah. patrol Lieutenant Emmerich he was kind of in charge he and I he was adventurous went into what they call the old Medina area and that would be what we call a slum area here and there was Arabs and Jews in there and the thing that really would kill you was that here on a Hot sunny day laying on a cement or stones would be maybe a dozen dressed chickens. Mm. And these people would fight, were fighting then like they do now. Uh, there was another area called New Medina, but it was about the same way. And one of the things I always remember if you wanted a drink of water, you could get it, but it came out of a goat skin. <laughs> the, French battleship was there in the harbor. Later on, it was put together and brought to the U.S. and redone so it could be put back in use. Then after that... Was this the, where there, you, there was an explosion in the harbor? Or where? Well, of course, the, when the Americans went in, they had to bomb right. that area. And that's how the rich the rich Lou got hit. And, and but I remember your... Oh, this, this would have been later. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, then <clears throat> we came back, and the ne our next run was to the Mediterranean through the Gibraltar. We went to Algiers, another town in the north part of it. And we also came back and made another convoy run. And So when you say making a run, is that a convoy? Yes, yes. Do you want to tell a little bit about what convoy duty was like? Yes, that yes, was... yes, very good. It's a, well, they might have 50 cargo ships and maybe that many destroyers and destroyer escorts around, and the convoy always zigzagged. In other words, it went so long, and then they would change course, and then they'd change course again and so forth. In other words, it took you maybe twice as long to get across because you did that. And then when we got into uh, the harbor, I always remember one of the things our chief commissary Stewart would always, when we went into port, we always worked quarters. That meant 
the old division, which was ordnance, torpedoman, fire controlman, and gunner's mates, we would be where we were supposed to be for quarters with dress uniforms on when we entered port. Now, I remember the chief commissary steward would always be out there and they'd looking, well, there's such and such ship and they're gonna be going back to the state. I'll go over there and see what I can get off of them. And he always would get food from them. So he, we'd always eat pretty good on the destroyer. Uh, were any of these convoys during the period where the submarines were so deadly and, and I don't there were lots ever of losses? I don't ever recall only one time they got one ship in our convoys, sure. I think. Before that, boy, they used to get a lot of them. And you know, if you took the story of the uh, Grass Bay, the reason the, the English, the British really got after it because it had sunk tons and tons of British shipments down off of Africa and Asia. And, but the, when the U.S. got involved, they, they cut that down quite a bit. Thanks to better convoys? And yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, we got, you were saying you were back in the Mediterranean. Yeah, and we were getting ready for the invasion of Sicily. I know I spent, I was even an SP shore patrol at Algiers, and I always remember the Marine, Marines were kind of taking, they were the policemen for the military, and I can remember some of the activities. Some of the soldiers would get a little under the weather, and He'd have to maybe even punch them in the jaw and lay them down. Oh my! Um, it, it's just hard to explain what it looks like where war has been, and people, you just can't imagine how bad it is. But anyway, we went to Sicily. We were in a screen. The the the, the squadron of destroyers. I then there were nine of them in a screen around the the landing force. <clears throat> now, about that time, the military had developed a IMF signal. Whenever a radar went on a plane, our planes would send back the signal, IMF, I am friendly, I am friendly. Well, we hadn't been on the screen very long that night until word come that the Maddox, which was just off our starboard bow, had been sunk. They we all sent the signal and the signal come back IMF, but that IMF dropped a 500 pound bomb on the torpedo tubes and all those 5,000 pound heads went off and there were only 65 survivors. And uh, the sad part about that was is from then on there was no airplane that was friendly. Some of the friendlies got shot. And then, I think it was, we were at general quarters for at least three days. I remember during the day we'd find a pilot that had had to bail out and he was, his fly saver didn't work and he'd be floating in the water. We'd pick him up and transfer him to another ship. And that third or fourth day, the torpedo officer said to me, what, why don't you lay down there and take a nap, you've been awake all this time. So I laid down and a little bit, they nudged me and said, oh, you better wake up, we just hit a mine. Oh. And uh, I hadn't any more got up and they said, pass the word, man overboard. Well, I was able to hear them say that it was Ramskowitz. His phones were hanging over the fan tail. Well, I knew Ramskowitz well enough. I said, before you put a boat in the water, look in the torpedo shack, because <laughs> if anything happened, that's where he went. <laughs> and he he was a product of World War I, and he, <laughs> that's where he was. <laughs> <laughs> now, after we left and got the beachhead secured, we were sent up along the west side of Sicily, up toward Italy one night. And when we returned back to Palermo, the Germans had just bombed and bombed things there. And here was a big four-motor job flying and our gunnery officer, well, we thought we had him. You could just see that plane's tail jump. But the story was that the computer stuck and they couldn't get it 
one second further that he got that plane. Now, there was uh, heavy cruisers in that bay, and the next day they would fire over the mountain to support the troops. And that one morning, I think it was the next morning, there was a plane come in and dropped a bomb. I think they wanted to hit the cruiser, but they missed it. And the thing that I always have said, I appreciated what I learned on the Milwaukee. And one of them was, is whenever there's action, you look the other way and find out what's coming from the other side. Because I could see everybody on the side, down on the deck watching to see what was going on over there. And to, to one side of the ship. Yep, on the port side. At about one, two, zero, that would be aft starboard. In the clouds, here come three ME 109s out. Ooh. And one of the things I've never told, I reported it, and I didn't even get the last words out. The anti aircraft battery had it going up. See, I was a battle phone talker. When I, on the Milwaukee, when I got my battle assignment to after main battery control, Lieutenant Pope said, Sailor, put those phones on. I'm going to make a battle phone talker out of you. And that's what I done all during the war when I was in, in a, and it, it took a little training and neck technique to do, know what to do. But I'll tell you, you heard a lot of things that were going on. In other words, you could hear the radio on the, in the pilot house and what was happening. When you were the talker, to whom were you talking? Well, I was reporting, like I said, uh, Three planes, one, two, zero. The other people, all the other people had battle phones. And when I said one, two, zero, when the zero come out, that any aircraft battery, he'd already told them. And you know, they, they knew, they were on my circuit too, you see. And they didn't get the planes, but they didn't get down to drop their bomb. So while you were in the harbor there protecting the Invasion. How often were you, how often did the German planes come over? Well, they had them pretty well in control. That was about the only time we saw any of them after that. Because our, our planes began to get in there and, and take care of it, you know. And they were moving up through Sicily pretty fast. It didn't take long. Now, we left not long after that and come back to the States. And we made one more trip to the Mediterranean with a convoy to replenish stock and went to Naples. And of course, Naples had, again, the results of war just devastates people, you know, and, and some of the things they do to make a living is, uh, one of the things when you see teenage, not even hardly teenage girls being sold, <laughs> it just breaks your heart. <laughs> I can understand. Then after that, we went back and we started running convoys across the North Atlantic. Um, we run uh, October, I mean September, and when we came back... This is 1943? Yes. See, in August of 28th, I, my girlfriend happened to be in New York and we got married. Oh. So I left and didn't suppose to be back for a while. Well, about the 10th of October, I was back in New York. So I called her and she said, well, I won't be able to come to New York. And I said, well, I know it, but I thought I ought to call my bride. <laughs> and uh, she, <laughs> next day I got a telegram. She was on her way. And I, <laughs> Later years, I wrote the story about the old telephone on the wall. It used to make people mad dog mad, sometimes from the lack of service, but it had services that you can't get today. And this is one of them. The next morning, a school board member brought his kids to school. He said, are you going to New York City? She said, <laughs> no. He said, oh, yes, you are. When that sailor's in port, we're going to close this school and you go to New York City. Oh, sweet. So, I saw the New York Yankees and St. Louis Cardinal, one of the games, and they had a real popular rookie. 
named Stan Musial. Oh. <laughs> then we left Port and we were back in for Thanksgiving and she came to New York again. Then we were on another convoy and we were back in about the 10th of January. That convoy duty, I was, some of my uh, nieces and nephews used to corner me, Uncle Bob, what was the worst time you ever had? And they were sure I was going to tell about an invasion time. I said, really, I would say the worst time I ever had was about 24 hours on Christmas Day, 1943. We were in a storm in the North Atlantic and the ship would go through a 100 foot wave and 1,700 ton would fall and hit the water and you never knew whether the next one was going to break it in two because it did break some in two once in a while. And when that was over, I think some of us felt like we'd been in a battle. <laughs> I read some of your stories yeah. from your crewmates and it's so dramatic. And I remember somehow a depth charge got out of the depth charge rack and I didn't want to send any other crew members down. So I had a life jacket on and a rope and I went down and cornered that thing and tied it down so that we could put it up after. I didn't know whether I'd make it without, but I lucked out. <laughs> See, we, when we left after the 10th, on the way, about two days out, we always went to general quarters at one hour before sunrise. Well, the second day out, I didn't go to general quarters. I was a sick man. And the next morning, Dr. Hazard said, well, you've got appendicitis. And I think I'd like to try putting an ice pack on that. So he did, and it it stopped it. And Because he didn't want to try surgery? He didn't time? want that rough weather. He didn't want to do surgery. So you and had a doctor on board? We had, yes. He was a Lieutenant JG. And so then we went to, um, Dr. Hazard was a good doctor. I can tell you another thing that happened that he did. I'll tell it a little later on. But he, he um, had me office. I didn't stand any watches. When I got back to New York, I said, you know, I feel real good, Doc. I think I could go on leave. And he said, oh, you're going to the hospital and get that thing taken out because I'm not going to be hanging on with one hand and carving on you with the other one. So I went. One of the things I always like to tell people about, that day after I got my appendix out, it took them about 25 minutes. The doctor had done it said, it's a good thing you got it out because it was a bunch of poison. Oh. And... Uh, I was sitting there on the wall across from me were 30 sailors that had hernia operations. Some of them had been there 30 days. They had to lay on their back 30 days. I remember one little guy, he got his about the same time I got my appendix. And on the nurses at night, there were two of them. It's, he said, I'm not going to use that ped van tonight. And he <laughs> crawled out and snuck to the restroom oh. ahead. And, but those years later, my grandson had a hernia operation, and three days later, he was sliding down a side. <laughs> so it really changed. I'll say. But so when, then we were back in on the, the 12th of February, so my wife didn't come, and on account of the fact I was in the hospital. And the 22nd, they sent word they were getting underway, and they wanted me back aboard. So I went back and. We went to England and uh, then we come back in April. This is now 1944. Yes. And in April, uh, they must, they knew that, uh, officers knew that we were going to be doing something, but they didn't tell us. They uh, gave us permission for 72 if we could fly. And I flew from Chicago to, from New York to Chicago and took the scout, the local down to Fort Madison, Iowa. It took me longer to get from Chicago to Fort Madison than it did from New York to Chicago. And 
it was nighttime and I knocked on the door and my wife was really surprised. I bet. <laughs> and I just got to stay, I don't know, not very many hours. I had to get the train and get back into Chicago. When I got to Chicago, one of my torpedo men was from Mokina and we met there and here come the police, military police, I want to see your leave papers. Well, apparently when they typed mine up, he made a mistake, so they erased it and corrected it. He figured I was oh. <laughs> cheating. He was getting ready to lock me up. Well, my ship, uh, torpedo man, he said, well, the same guy typed mine up that typed his up the same day. <laughs> so the guy, he, that was he acquiesced. Now, if he'd have taken me, I would have missed Normandy. <laughs> oh, my. Now, we left. When we got back, we left for Norm and went to uh, Britain. Okay, at I think it was uh, Bristol, England. That was up in Ireland, Bristol and and London area. They had the officers come over for meetings, and they come back to the ship and different than what they done at Sicily. They got us together and told us what was going to happen. And one of the things they said was, is the Herndon will be the first ship in behind the minesweeper. And I always figured the reason they did that, we had a skipper that was really calm. If you turn the screws up too much, you could set off a mine. And Commander Moore was really good at that. So they had more than one session. So all the ships that we were tied up to knew that the Herndon was going to be the first one in. And we got a lot of this kind of thing. Oh, you poor suckers, you. You ain't got a chance. And if it hadn't been for... When we set out there, we dropped anchor in the channel for probably five hours before we went in. But Let's back up for a second. So, yeah. did you when you were up there? Were you also doing training for this for the invasion? Well, the big thing was is we were given a lot of um, discussion about how to take care of ourselves if we sunk. You know, oh. uh, life jackets and and the explosions. You're supposed to put your hand in your rectum if you're in the water so that it wouldn't blow up your guts. You know, and oh my goodness. that kind of thing. Mostly defensive stuff, and but we knew that when we got in, we would have targets to fire on after we got in there. Uh, but the, they bombed that coastline, and I can tell you, this is one guy that hardly ever goes to a Fourth of July celebration because that fireworks is toys compared to what we saw that night. So now it's June fifth. You're talking sixth. about the that was the sixth. Sixth. See, they delayed it today. Right. <laughs> and uh, so then we went in, and we were sitting off of a little town called Grandy Camp. And up on the ridge above it was a big gun. How far were you from shore? Probably two thousand yards. Oh my gosh, that close. Yes, you could see people walking in the street. Now back of Grandy camp and over that gun we fire we had a pattern we'd fire up 50 up 50 up 50 up 50 then over 50 down 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 over and did that over and over for a little bit and uh, this was in the preliminary sort of firing yes, yes. before you got that was people before they that was before the boats began to come in and of course where we were we could see Utah Beach real plain we could see the craft going into Norm, and, but uh, we couldn't see the beach there. And uh, about 10 o'clock, USS Saturday was sitting there with a cliff, big cliff, and that gun sat on that cliff. They got that gun man and they'd fire, they couldn't depress enough to hit the Saturday. And then they fired over in the other area where ships were. And uh, we were always told at that time that they sunk the quarry, but what really happened, and if you get on the computer and pull off the history of the quarry, the captain got excited and he said, get out of there. 
revved up the screws and set off a mine. This was another destroyer? Yes. Oh my. And uh, that wasn't all. There were two destroyer escorts were going to go help them. <laughs> Same thing happened to them. But uh, we, then here come a boat. I think the Saturday might have had these rangers on there. The boat come and those rangers scaled that cliff and went and took that gun out. Well, this is that famous cliff that uh, yeah. people talk about. I see. <laughs> I, I don't know history. We're talking about history, but one of the things happened, ain't been but about six years ago, I was working at a farm store in Burlington and Couple, some old boys were talking and he said, what'd you do, Norway? He said, well, I was a ranger and we went and scaled a cliff and took out the big gun. And I couldn't resist when he got up the counter. I said, you know, I was on the USS Herndon when you scaled that cliff and had a pair of binoculars. You ain't changed much in all these years. <laughs> <laughs> it, little things like that kind of. So if I understand, one of the one of the things about being that close to shore was that gun couldn't couldn't depress enough to hit yeah. you. That was a small. They were event. damaged too, you know, yeah. from the bombing. They were damaged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and well, in the process of uh, craft going to the beach, once in a while, one of them would get lost. One of them came alongside, and we had to bail the water out for them and oh. and give them some supplies and help them get the direction to get to the beach. And <laughs> now, one of the things that the Utah beach that we got to see, some of those landing crafts were just loaded with rockets and they'd go up to the beach and then they'd fire those rockets to the beach beachhead. Picture you never saw the like. It is fire. Sort of mobile <laughs> artillery, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Now and once the once the troops were on shore, were you then helping them were they well, calling back to you? Um about three days later we were sent to a spot and we went in after another destroyer was there and fired on the beach, and we fired on the beach. And we had a newsman on there while we were at Normandy, Tom Wolf. Tom Wolf. And, you know, nobody knew where we were, but about five or six days after Normandy, they began to learn because the headlines in the paper was the Lucky Herndon storms the beaches of Normandy. <laughs> Tom Wolf, and uh, we fired, and, I, and like I said, I had the battle phones on, and I could hear that, and they would say, give us rapid fire. You got them going to go. Give us rapid fire. So they give them rapid fire, but less than five minutes of rapid fire, you got to slow down because a gun gets hot and burn the paint off, which it did, and then they'd have to slow it down, and well, can you give us rapid fire? They'd give them some more rapid fire, and then they'd have to slow it down. Now, one of the things that happened that day, probably five miles up south of us, I could see a splash. It looked like you might have thrown a small rock in the water. And a little bit that splash was a little closer to us, a little closer. And then I reported, there's a salvo, and the next one might hit us. Well, the next one went over us, but by that time we had the anchor pulled, and as we pulled out the wake where we left, oh my God. the salvo went in. What sort of weapon? It was, was an 88 that? millimeter, and they oh. they were spotting in. Right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that first night on the picket line, there was an interesting thing happened. This is June 5th, 6th now? Yeah, mm -hmm. after we'd went in and we'd fired on the beach that day, and then that night we would go Destroyers would go, they would go forward 2,000 yards, and then they would back down gently 2,000 yards. The destroyer in front of us might be, their bow might be facing ours, they'd come forward and then they'd back down. Well, there was a plane fly over and it just kept flying over and you could tell from the silhouette that it was a German plane, it was a four-motored job. And the, uh, I said to the torpedo officer, that's a, tor that's a German plane, and uh, we told the captain, he, he was on the bridge, and after about four or five times, our real calm captain, <laughs> he came on, he gave that plane a name, and he said to the, he called up to the gunnery officer, the next time he goes over, give him hell. Well, 
Next time he came over, Moulton fired on him, and but they didn't knock any plane down. The gunnery officer we had at Sicily was a reserve officer, but he was really savvy. D.F. Chamberlain, so naturally he was Dog Fox Chamberlain, <laughs> and he came. He was a navigator, but he come online, Captain. Now that you've given that so and so a hell, I'd advise you to get your ass out of here, or you're going to get it shot off. So the captain moved out of there. The USS Meredith, a 90, destroyer just commissioned 90 days before, a flush deck knew it moved in where we were and it got what we would have gotten. <laughs> it was bombed? A torpedo. Oh, a torpedo. And uh, so they got it to the beach, but it sunk. They didn't, they, they never could salvage it. I can see why they called it the Lucky Herndon then. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, well, Tom Wolf did a good job on that. He, and he died here in his not too many years, just I recently. Um, I thought we, we went back to Portsmouth and Reef put on, got, when we got through firing on the beach, we only had about 10% of ammunition. So we went to Portsmouth, England and re, re got filled up. Yeah. Went back to the beachhead a little while, then wasn't many days. We went to um, um, Alexandria, Egypt for a little R&R. &R. Oh my God. And they said, don't eat anywhere but at the Red Cross. That's the only place I eat, but about the second or third day I was there, I got up in the morning and I had a healthy bowel movement. And 15 minutes later, I had another healthy one. 30 minutes later, I had another healthy one. And then after that, they weren't healthy. Oh, dear. And I had diarrhea. And the, the doctor gave me 30 sulfa pills. And I got all but five of them down. And he didn't know how many I lost, so he gave me 30 more. <laughs> and the next few days, I laid down on a pallet underneath the torpedo tubes. And everything went around and around and around. But if you ever read about Civil War soldiers and their bout with the dysentery or diarrhea. Yeah. I can know what, in a, if it hadn't been for sulfa, 24 hours, I'd have been dead. Right. Yep. But when, so when you were, when you came off the beach of Normandy, you went all the way across the Mediterranean for leave then to Alexandria, Egypt? Mm -hmm. Was it normally that far away or? Well, we, uh, what we were doing was getting ready for southern France. See? Oh. So we come back and then we we escorted the aircraft carriers for southern France. Now what what which month was this? Was this July? In July, last right. of July. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then uh, after that we came back to the States. I think uh, we made one more trip across the Atlantic. Oh, I know we did. But we went part way and then come back to Bermuda because that's when Roosevelt went across and had his meeting. And um, I always remember at Bermuda we did a little recreation. So we played touch football. Well, the sailors, they don't know what the word touch meant. <laughs> we played it was tackle football. So I was quarterback and I was going to pass the ball. And nobody was out there where I was going to pass. So I run. So well, somebody got to me and tripped me up, and when I fell, I hit somebody's heel with the left eye, and so that was a black eye. And about three days later, the firing room had borrowed our steam hose that we used to steam off the ice on the torpedo tubes. And he came and just threw it in the torpedo shack, so I went to tell him where to put it. And when I come out of that fire room hatch and stepped out from the scupper that was around it, Something hit me right there. It was a lead-centered heaving line ball. Oh. <laughs> I had two black eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so was it a convoy that escorted President Roosevelt's ship across? Well, yeah, he was on the USS Augusta, I think it was, because they had an elevator on there so he could go up and down there. Uh, and. We went so far and some met us and then they went on with him. He had him well protected, yeah. While we're 
talking about that, there was another story that you told about whether that was the Queen Mary or not that you met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at one time. Do you want to say anything about that uh, incident? <laughs> well, um, we uh, uh, see the Queen Mary. They could get up enough speed; they went without an escort. And uh, sometimes we would stay with them when we went out of New York until they could get up speed, and then they went. Okay. They would zigzag, but they could go 45 knots, and there was no torpedo that fast, you know. And and uh, but different times we would see that ship or one of them like it, I see. and <laughs> they would be going like mad. It, the, the North Atlantic was really a treacherous thing. We really had to learn how to live with it. I always remember a good shipmate on the Milwaukee got paid off when we came back from Hawaii in 1941, January. But he got on his motorcycle and rode the East Coast. And when we were in, in Newport, here he was, and he'd re-enlisted, and he was on the USS Ingram. And not long after we saw him there, they were out near Nova Scotia and there was a ship that had some problems, so they went to help, but it was foggy. And they by chance hit a ship and started sinking and their depth charges went off and there wasn't many survivors on that I destroyer. Teddy Bear Lawler, our good old friend, he was a torpedo man. He didn't make it. How sad. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, night, let's see, You'd finished the invasion of southern France, mm -hmm. and you returned and yeah. then escorted Af Roosevelt, and yeah. I think that's where we... After left. Roosevelt, we went up to Maine to do some uh, battle practice and torpedo practice. By that time, our chief torpedo man, I think sometime when I was on leave, he got made warrant officer and got transferred. P.E. True, he, was, he had about 25 years in the Navy. He was really... He'd been on submarines, he'd been on a USS Niblack when it was a new destroyer, and then he was on the Herndon. And I learned a lot about torpedoes from P.E. True. He knew what to do. And he told us how to do it, and then let us do it. Got out of the way, and let us do it. So here I am, torpedo in first class, and I'm in charge of the torpedo gang. And they begin to worry about, well, they're going to have to fire a torpedo shot. And the torpedo chief, the torpedo officer came to me and said, well, I'll get a chief torpedo to come and help you. And I said, Mr. Stevenson, we can do it. And they even got Captain Moore kind of concerned. And he, he was very diplomatic. He didn't just race down to the torpedo shack and say, hey, Whit, can you do it or anything? He happened to catch me in the right place where nobody else was around. He said, what do you think about this torpedo shot, Whit? And I said, Captain, I'm glad you asked me because the same people are, are going to be on the same station that fired the last one. <laughs> he said, it sounds like you got a plan. I never heard any more music about it. <laughs> and it worked. It was real good. Now, we got a new skipper before we left the East Coast. And... Uh, we were pulling out of Boston, and we were getting ready to go to the West Coast. This was in March. This was 1945? Yes. So you were going to the Pacific Theater? Yep. Oh, my gosh. I was in the torpedo shack, and they had a new striker, and heard one ship go beep, and heard another one go, no, the one ship went beep, beep. Then I heard the other one go beep, beep. And that striker said, what, what does that mean? I said, if I know what the rules of the roads are, it means that somebody's going to hit somebody here in a little oh, bit. No. In a little bit, crunch, crunch. They hit a wood minesweeper, harbor minesweeper, sunk it. 30 crew members salvaged and brought aboard the Herndon. And, of course, they were in, it was cold weather. And they uh, took them down to the mess hall and gave them all a shot of, Brandy to pep them up, and I think the whole crew of the Herndon was ready to jump in the water. Anyway, we went back in. There had to be a hearing, 
In the meantime, they got to looking at the Herndon and decided they kept us in over 30 days in the Navy Yard. They found some seams that when that mine hit had cracked the seam. Oh, yeah. and uh, So that held us up about a month and a half from getting to the West Coast. And meantime, we got another Torpedoman second class aboard and he was on a destroyer that was in a storm down in, off of Florida and it sunk and some of those survivors, he was one of the survivors, he was so messed up that when we got to San Diego, they took him off. Oh dear. And of course in San Diego, I always said one of the things I remember when we, I was a recruit in San Diego, Broadway, when you went up Broadway, every bar, you could hear this song, San Antone, or South of the Border, and, and I, I even, I think when the war wasn't quite over yet, they were still singing that same song. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, of course, at that time, I was going to be a father, and I was kind of concerned, and we went on then to Pearl Harbor, and we did some gunnery there, and I think I even fired torpedo shots there. And it was in Ju about the 1st of July, so the, ship, of the ship was preparing for war, war service in the Pacific. Yes, Center. yes. And uh, we left Pearl around the 10th. Well, it was about the 10th when we got to, Bor or to uh, Marshall Islands in a wee talk. Incidentally, I think that's where they used the trial run on the atomic bomb was at that island later on. It was just, the out water line was just covered with wrecked airplanes. <clears throat> and uh, that's when I told the, the omen said what they're going to transfer the first class. And so I if you want it, you better work on it. So I said, well, I believe I'll try it, but you have to give me the or number of that Bureau of Personal Order. It came out in 1941. And so I went to Mr. Stevenson and said, I understand you're transferring the first class and I'd like to have the transfer. Why don't you tell where they were transferring the person? To Advanced Torpedo School. Back in the States? You see, they had told me I couldn't make Chief Petty Officer because I hadn't been to Advanced Torpedo School. And I thought maybe if I was going to make chief, I'd better go. And he said, Whit, I can't spare you. So I said, that's exactly what I wanted you to say because Bureau Personnel Order, and I gave him the number, says you'll transfer the most desirable man in the rating. I believe you told me who that is. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He was a good guy. I, was, I talked to him years later. He was a judge in New Mexico. I talked to him a few times. He was, so then... Like I told, I got on the NOE talk, as the fellow said, uh, hey, fella, I don't remember your name, but I know you're a torpedo on the Milwaukee, and it was Charlie Bentley. If I ever wanted to see another guy, it'd be Charlie Bentley. But what really decked me was the next morning we got on the troop transport, the other guy I wanted to see was Char Bill Dalton. So they'd been... They'd got ratings to first class. I was first class. And here we were just riding that troop transport back to Seattle, Washington. These were two of your shipmates from the USS Milwaukee. Yes. Oh, my God. And fellows that had helped me a lot when I was just a recruit, Charlie Bentley was from Logan, West Virginia. And I always remember <laughs> he, he could be serious and he could be humorous and he wouldn't, he wouldn't run from a problem. Lieutenant Pope told us one time we were going to have the equator crossing, and he said, now, Charlie, uh, Lieutenant Commander Vodilla, that was a gunnery officer, and he had a mustache and had hair like, boy, you never, he said, now, instant Manus, I think you can cut his hair, and everything, but Lieutenant Commander Vodilla, he's awful proud of it, I think. I always remember Charlie said, well, Mr. Pope, I'll tell you, I think we can handle Instant Manus, but I'll tell you, I feel awful sorry for Lieutenant Commander's hair. Oh. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Vodilla's hair. And, but he didn't, they didn't do anything, but he, he didn't, Pope kept his mouth shut after that. 
then we're going to pause while he changes the tape. Okay. <laughs> were you? I, I missed one step. You um, were saying you were with two of your former yes, chefs, and, Milwaukee. and I had a very enjoyable two weeks coming back to Seattle. It was actually the town near Seattle. Interesting thing, the ship's writer in that Navy base, he had a thing about regular Navy. If you came in that port from the Pacific, he didn't look about how long you'd been there or anything. If it said RN, regular Navy, after your name, it was automatic, 30 days leave with traveling time. Oh. So I, my experience in receiving stations was not good. So I got up early that morning, even before six, went to Chow Hall, and about quarter after six, I'm coming back to the barracks, and someone said, hey, tubes. That's what they call torpedo. Yeah. Is your name Whitson? I said, yeah. He said, the ship's rider's looking for you. He's got your leave papers already. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I didn't even have any money. I had to send a telegram and get money wired so I could get a <laughs> ticket. <laughs> didn't have credit cards in those days. Nope. So uh, then uh, when I uh, went, the train went from Portland to Denver, or no, to uh, Omaha. Then I got another train from Omaha to Burlington, Iowa. And I went through Cheyenne. Well, this Keith Jacobs that I beat out on the transfer, that's where his family lived. And I stopped, and there was a layover there of about three hours. So I looked his family up and, and visited with them a little bit. Oh. But uh, got home, and naturally, after six weeks, saw my new daughter. and got pictures taken and then <clears throat> when I got back to San Diego I was at quarters that morning and somebody slapped me on the back and said what do you want when you leave here <laughs> here's my former chief torpedo man warrant torpedo man PE true I said well I generally have learned to take what the Navy gives me he said well I talked to the guy that does the hiring and firing if you make good grades, you got a chance to stand on the staff. Well, I managed to be the honor student, and I did get on the staff. This is the staff of what? The, the torpedo school. Okay. I, was, I was an instructor on the torpedo. And uh, I'll have to say, one day, I was busy giving instruction on the reducing valve, and the old chief torpedo that was in the office came to the door and he said to this young fireman, yeah, Whitson, he's right over there. And some kid from back home, I, I didn't ever, I couldn't recognize him. And I, I was too proud to say, well, what's your name? And I'd said, well, where's your ship? Long Beach, heard from home, yeah. He didn't do anything to help me. <laughs> and I, I'd give a little instruction and I'd talk to him. And finally, I'd said something and he kind of smiled and it come to me, his two front teeth looked like my two front teeth. It was one of my brothers. What? Well, when I was home on leave, he was in school and he, even while he was going to school, worked for the railroad, so I never did see him. And he joined the Navy during the senior year in high school. <laughs> was on the USS Louisville, and you know what? If he, he was a fireman, and the Japs decided to bomb while he was on in the fire room, or they'd have got him, because it was his battle station they hit. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so, he, he, I never told him that I didn't know who he was. Years later, we family reunion, I told him, and he was really upset. <laughs> he said, I thought it was funny, after a little bit, you said Lyle's out in the harbor, so my brother Lyle was there on the Den Denimola, and we spent the weekend together, the three of us. <laughs> what a coincidence. And uh, so then the torpedo school was a good experience, but then one day the captain, Captain Lidstone, I was coming down the hall, and he motioned me, Whitson, would you come here? Would you consider staying with the Fleet Training Center? They were closing the torpedo school and all the gunnery schools. They were having a 
new set of schools where a ship was in port, they could send a crew over for training on spotting drill or many other things. If they didn't get finished with it when they were in Hawaii, at Pearl Harbor, they could get... Uh, you were saying you were with two of your former U.S. Yes, and, Milwaukee. and I had a very enjoyable two weeks coming back to Seattle. It was actually the town near Seattle. The interesting thing, the ship's writer in that Navy base, he had a thing about regular Navy. If you came in that port from the Pacific, he didn't look about how long you'd been there or anything. If it said RN, regular Navy, after your name, it was automatic, 30 days leave with traveling time. Oh. So I, my experience in receiving stations was not good. So I got up early that morning, even before six, went to Chow Hall, and about Quarter after six, I'm coming back to the barracks, and someone said, hey, tubes, that's what they call torpedo. Yeah. Is your name Whitson? I said, yeah. He said, that ship's rider's looking for you. He's got your leave papers already. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I didn't even have any money. I had to send a telegram and get money wired so I could get a <laughs> ticket. <laughs> didn't have credit cards in those days. Nope. So uh, then uh, when I... Uh, Went, the train went from Portland to Denver, or no, to uh, Omaha. Then I got another train from Omaha to Burlington, Iowa. And I went through Cheyenne. Well, this Keith Jacobs that I beat out on the transfer, that's where his family lived. And I stopped, and there was a layover there of about three hours. So I looked his family up and, and visited with them a little bit. Oh. But uh, got home and Naturally, after six weeks, saw my new daughter and got pictures taken. And then, <clears throat> when I got back to San Diego, I was at quarters that morning, and somebody slapped me on the back and said, "What do you want when you leave here?" <laughs> Here's my former chief torpedo man, warrant torpedo man, P.E. True. I said, well, I generally have learned to take what the Navy gives me. He said, well, I talked to the guy that does the hiring and firing. If you make good grades, you got a chance to stand on the staff. Well, I managed to be the honor student. And I did get on the staff. This is the staff of what? The uh, torpedo school. Okay. I, was, I was an instructor on the torpedo. And uh, I'll have to say one day... I was busy giving instruction on the reducing valve and the old chief torpedo man that was in the office came to the door and he said to this young fireman, yeah, Whitson, he's right over there. And some kid from back home, I, I didn't ever, I couldn't recognize him. And I, I was too proud to say, well, what's your name? And I'd said, well, where's your ship? Long Beach, heard from home? Yeah, he didn't do anything to help me, <laughs> and I, I'd give a little instruction, and I'd talk to him. And finally, I would said something, and he kind of smiled, and it come to me, his two front teeth looked like my two front teeth. He was one of my brothers. What? Well, when I was home on leave, he was in school, and he even while he was going to school, worked for the railroad, so I never did see him. And he joined the Navy during the senior year in high school, <laughs> was on the USS Louisville. And you know what? If he, he was a fireman and the Japs decided to bomb while he was on in the fire room or they'd have got him because it was his battle station they hit. <laughs> oh. And uh, so he, he, I never told him that I didn't know who he was. Years later, we family reunion, I told him, and, he was really upset. <laughs> he said, I thought it was funny. After a little bit, you said, Lyle's out in the harbor. So my brother Lyle was there on the Den Denaboa, and we spent the weekend together, the three of us. <laughs> what a coincidence. And uh, so then the torpedo school was a good experience. But then one day, the captain, Captain Lidstone, I was coming down the hall and he motioned me, Whitson, would you come here?
Would you consider staying with the Fleet Training Center? They were closing the torpedo school and all the gunnery schools. They were having a new set of schools where a ship was in port, they could send a crew over for training on spotting drill or many other things. If they didn't get finished with it when they were at Hawaii, at Pearl Harbor, they could get the rest of it. Or down at Guam, they could get the rest of it. And uh, there was a lot of preparation for that. We learned to write lesson plans. Here I am. I had never been to college or anything. I finished high school in good shape. Uh, but um, we just did a lot of drills and so forth. and. Uh, learned how to speak, and I got a lot of rewards. One, at one time, we, the Navy had given Mexico three or four sub-chasers, and they brought those Mexicans up for training on how to do the depth charge, K-guns and so forth. And I got a special award from the captain for the way I trained the Mexicans. Oh. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, I shipped over then because the shore duty was good. There wasn't anything much you could do back home because they were still recovering from the war. This is 1946 or so? Yes. And so in August 6, 46, I shipped over and we drove back cross country and, and uh, maybe one of the nicest things I ever did for myself, I drove down 66 going back, you know, uh, which isn't there anymore. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I think uh, when we got to Arizona, we went down south from 66 and crossed to San Diego. Uh, that last day it was raining and I had to go through water holes. Did get back in time to report on time. And uh, about April of 48, I'd been on shore duty two years and eight months or nine months. They decided it's time for me to go to sea. The USS Dixie, a destroyer tender, was in the harbor, so I got transferred out there. I took 10 days leave and hauled my family back home and come back and finished out the day and went home myself. Finished your, that and your re up enlistment, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing, I, a lot of things. I mean, San Diego changed, has changed a lot since I was there. I was out there a few years ago to a shipmates reunion, and you just couldn't believe how much changed. Of course, I could recognize the Aztec Hotel, and the zoo was about the same. <laughs> really? Of course, we used to do that since the little girl was there. And uh, then uh, when I got home, of course, Illinois, they honored the veterans with a little special money, I think it was, and awards. And I went to an ag class. I was going to be a big farmer, but uh, I didn't own any land, and I wasn't going to be able to buy any of the way things were going. So I decided one day to sell those 40 head of dairy cows and go to work in a factory. So I worked a little, I worked a year and a half for Champion Spark Plug and when they went public with their stock, Ford found out that they tripled their worth in three years so they bought Autolite and made their own plugs. Oh. <laughs> and so I got laid off so I went to work for GE and they made switch gear. And I was a trib attendant. Then I went to the shipping and receiving clerk and one day the boss came to me and he said, you've gone as far as you can with me and they need a maintenance electrician on the second shift and we looked at your records and we think you can handle that. So I was worked with a guy and was broke in for 30 days and went on nights by myself and one day the old boy in the fab shop where they cut the metal said, what would you take a Look at that welder. Red's worked on it all day. He's changed transformers and everything. And see if you can fix it. I don't, now, I don't expect you to be able to fix it. Just look at it. So I went back and I sat down on it and I put my foot on the pedal. It turned the switch on and huh, 
I reached down and took the cover plate off and lifted it up and put the bolt in that switch pedal and it worked like a clock. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't uh, long until there was a new do all saw outside the crib. And as long as they held the start button down, it'd run. If you took it off, it'd quit. It was about quitting time for Red, and he, I come in, he said, oh, you're gonna have to jury rig the switch. Well, I said uh, to a kid there, you help me a little, you push down on the switch. I opened the door and started testing circuits, and circuit number eight, no juice. Looked on the door, it said counter. That starting button was in, in the middle of a ring, and that ring was the counter. I said, move that counter. It was stuck between three and four. After that, it worked like a clock. Well, you know, sometimes when you do good, it doesn't always pay off. You know what the factory told Red when he was out there? Just leave it. Whit will fix it when he comes in. Oops. And he couldn't handle that, and they'd keep writing me up about things, most ridiculous things. And I said to the boss, what's the matter? Somebody don't think I'm carrying my man? And he said, oh, there's a SOB trying to make a name for himself. And one night, come home, my wife had been after me on days. And said, Bauer Roller Bearing wants to note, said, Bauer Roller Bearing wants to talk to you. So I went over there and worked five years. <laughs> then that's when I became assurance agent. Okay. Well, as you, as you look back at the decision in 1948 about whether... <coughs> or when you decided not, do you regret having not stayed in for the next 12 years or so, oh, like your brother did? No, I really, I really never did look at it that way. And um, I started a new life and, and we got our kids through college and I've not, well, we're doing all right. I mean, oh, of course, yeah, you know, and we kept the farm and and inflation, we sold it, and I don't think we got enough if we had to go live in a nursing home the rest of our life, but if we can live until we die without having to, we'll be all right. Well, when you talk to your grandchildren or your children about the period you were in the Navy, what, and are there other highlights you want to make sure they know that maybe you haven't had a chance to talk to us about? Oh, yes, I think um, one of the things, uh, when, when I joined the Navy, there really wasn't much opportunity unless you did go to college. And it was really an uphill thing, especially if you're the oldest of 10 children, 11, which they turned out to be eventually. And, uh, but I always thought it was the best thing I ever done because I learned a lot of things about human beings and about, <laughs> I think I have a saying I like to say to a person, I knew this old boy and he said, you know, there's been a lot of changes around here and I've been against every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've not been like that. I've, I'm ready for change. I'm even ready for another one. <laughs> so nice. And uh, I think, um, you know, Another thing I learned to do, when I was on the Herndon, and I, I was the first class in charge of the torpedo gang, one of the things I should have brought out is when you went on a new ship, they had a constitution called the Ship's Articles. And it told how the mess cooks would be furnished. In other words, the O Division, there was gunner's mate, fire controlman, and torpedo man. One of them would furnish a mess cook and one of them would furnish a compartment cleaner, and one would furnish a mastered arms. The mastered arms always served at night, and they would rotate that. Hmm. Well, one of my friends made chief gunner's mate, and he came to me and he said, Whit, Moulton wants the torpedo man to furnish all three. And you know, I thought, here they're trying to take advantage of me just because I'm not chief and I'm just, so I told him Moulton could go do some things to himself, and he, he didn't argue with me. He come the second time, I told him the same thing. Third time he come, he said, Moulton wants that list. My answer was, Jim, when you and Moulton 
show me that they've changed the ship's articles, I'll give you that list. You know what? They never did have to <laughs> furnish all three. Now, we've been to shipmates association meetings and so forth. I never did go to hunt and say, you so-and-so. <laughs> ne it wasn't, you know, that's not what it's all about. <laughs> and uh, he's one of the few that's still alive, but <laughs> I think he finally wound up being a lieutenant. I think I I I think one of the things I've gleaned from this is uh, we there is a lot of change and it's for the good for the good if somebody wants to build a fence around our country and keep us out of the rest of the world they've got a problem. <laughs> It, would, it sounds as if one another thing you you learned is that the sort of you had had a a, a lucky I, I don't know if that's the right word yes. but you've told us at least two of your sister ships were yes. badly injured or sunk and you were at the front of the Normandy invasion and yet mm -hmm. thanks to good luck and a good commander and others your ship survived. Yep, yep, yep. And really, really, I do. I'm I'm very humble about that because. When I went to torpedo school at Newport, Rhode Island in 1941, I was a seaman second. I met, there was 125 or 30 in that class. I met some people that I lost during the war. And you sometimes, for a moment, have to say, how did I keep from being there? And I, my poor mother, if she'd have lost one of her sons, I don't think she could have handled it. And, and yet she had three or four of them in the Navy. Well, yeah, and then the other three, the other, there were two others that were in Vietnam and Korea. Oh my gosh. But they, they one of them didn't go overseas and one of them went to Germany instead of to Asia. And, uh, so, but my folks were very supportive. Uh, they weren't ridiculous. They were very supportive. <laughs> I never, never will forget the uh, Milwaukee. I mentioned something about they had cockroaches. I get a package from my mother. And I couldn't figure out what it was for a long time because they'd rotted. What, it was some hedge balls. Hedge balls are supposed to get rid of cockroaches. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> She'd go. She was going to cure the USS Herndon the cockroaches. <laughs> 555 feet of cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell about when, when, you see, after World War, after Pearl Harbor, the Milwaukee was in the Navy Yard at that time, and I stood a fire watch, and I, you know, welder said, what? He said, hey, Tube. Or no, he said, hey, mate, isn't that something? Jeff bombed Pearl Harbor. I said, that never could happen. I was out there. They couldn't do that. And he didn't argue with me. But when I went up to Chow, here was about 50 or 60 guys around the radio supply office. So when they got us ready to get underway, we went to Panama and took a, with a convoy to Bora Bora, which, if you remember, that's where Mishner was for a while on that island. But we refueled and come back. On the way out, we had a mess cook that uh, got sick and he wasn't feeling good. And he went down to the doctor and he said, Doc, you better operate. I think I'm going to die. Well, they did finally. I mean, he had a twisted intestine and he did oh. die. So they put him in a box and put him in the cooler. But one day on the way back to Panama, saw the doctor and a bunch of them and they were throwing cold cuts over the side. Tell you what, we eat a lot of canned food from there on into Panama. Oh my gosh. The cooler had quit working. <laughs> so the story was that we got to Puerto Rico, San Juan, and they set that box, that crate out on the dock. And things kind of got messed up. 
and it was four or five days before they someone decided, what is that box? This was the coffin? Yes. Oh. Things were kind of messed up by that time, as you well know. I guess. Yeah. Navy depended on a lot of people to be thoughtful. Sometimes they weren't. <laughs> Do you have any other things you'd like to say during this, as we finish the interview? Well, when I uh, left to go in the Navy and talking about Route 60, I hadn't been in more, more than three or four counties. I had been to Chicago and St. Louis on a livestock truck, but that's at night and you didn't see much. Um, then when I was home on leave in 46, we went down Route 66, I said, it, Springfield, Missouri, I stayed at Rock Motel. And about 40 years later, but 40 years later, I had about four siblings living down there. My my parents, when they were, after they retired, moved down there because some of my brothers and sisters were there and there was a good hospital there and my mother needed a lot of attention. When we went down, I couldn't find the Rock Motel because 66 didn't go by. The Rock Motel had changed. There was a black, I, I, when we were there in 46, I went down to the square at Springfield, Missouri, and the old farmers were out there leaning on the parking meter, smoking their pipe and their cigar, and I drove down a tar road and turned right to get to that. And 40 years later, I went down that tar road, that's 65, was, was a four-lane highway, mm -hmm. four-lane street and 65 went around <laughs> Springfield. And uh, there was a, a motel, and then a little further there was another motel. And my brother was running a bakery and my dad was working for him at night and Springfield has boomed ever since. Oh. And uh, I can remember driving to Champaign in the 30s to a 4-H softball tournament coming down route 10 and seeing a farmhouse about every half mile and a barn and then two years ago this coming january we drove over to look at the uh, condo we were going to be moving into and drove up 72 and hardly ever saw a farmhouse and when it did there was 10 or 15 grain bins around it oh. <laughs> so and Champagne had a lot more people, and Mojave had twice as many people. <laughs> so it really has changed. Like I, I said, I was an insurance agent, and I, and I learned too that at the time I was an agent, they had more agents than they needed in the county, but, and the population was dropping. I used to drive up a certain road, 1800 north, count the houses that were empty this year, and next year, and the, the last time I went up it, I, there was 40 in 10 miles, 40 houses that had no people in it. They used to have people that went to school. So, change. Not about a month ago, there was a, an obituary in the Gazette for a former university man, Dick Carlisle. And he was raised on one of the farms I went by. It was 160 acres. There were five siblings, and they all got a college education off of that 160 oh acres. Gosh. But that operation now is probably a $5 million hog operation. <laughs> I got to sell some of the insurance to cover it. <laughs> I see. I guess that's about it. I Well, I appreciate your coming, and thank you very much for sharing your story with us. Appreciate it. I'm glad to do it. I think that's that'll be it then. David? Thank you very much. Don't move until he unpins you and uh,